You're calling me over You're pulling me close With love you surround me You give me Well, we're in a series of sermons from 1 John, and the title of this series is Fellowship with God, and today is the 10th sermon in that series, and we, um, we've been finding out a lot of things uh, about fellowshipping with God, and I'm sure that we have only scratched the surface. So this morning, we're going to talk about another thing that is concerned with fellowshipping with God. And as you know, I don't have to tell you that most of the world is still suffering from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I uh, got to looking and thinking about that, and a pandemic is anything that covers a wide geographical area, and it affects an exceptionally high proportion of the people in that area. And so that's what a pandemic is. And needless to say, COVID-19 is a pandemic. And for most of us, uh, the word pandemic uh, was foreign to us probably until the first of this year. We never thought about uh, a pandemic. We talk about epidemics sometimes, but pandemic, something that affects the whole world, was really, uh, was really not in our vocabulary. And um, the effects, as you know, from the, from the COVID-19 pandemic uh, on the entire world has affected us economically. It's affected us academically. Uh, those of you who are school teachers and students, I don't have to tell you that. It's affected us socially, politically, emotionally, and religiously. It's affected us in every area of our life. However, there's another pandemic that is raging out of control in our country and actually in the entire world, and it can be far more dangerous than COVID-19. It's more deadly than COVID-19, and it's, and it's raging in our world. And that other pandemic that has invaded our society is something called deception. Deception. Deception is everywhere today, and it affects everyone. Not one of us is immune to being deceived. And as you can see, the title of my sermon this morning is The Other Pandemic. We're going to read a few verses of Scripture from 1 John. And first of all, we're going to read from chapter 3, one verse, verse 7. It says, little children, let no one deceive you. Little children. This is John writing, and John is maybe in his 90s by this time. And he's writing to the church as though they were his little children, and many of them were. And he said, listen, little children, don't let anyone deceive you. And then we jump down to chapter 4, verse 1. It says, beloved. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. The other pandemic called deception will always suppress the truth. It will always suppress the truth. The purpose of, the purpose of deception is to trap us. It's to ensnare us, and it's to lead us astray, and it's to lead us away from the straight and narrow path. Deception is a lie, and it will always, always try to suppress the truth. That's why it's so important for you and me to study the Word of God. The Word of God, as I have said many, many times, is the source of all truth. And if we study this word of God, we're going to know the truth, and the Bible says that the truth will keep us free. It'll set us free, but it'll keep us free. And so this word is so important that we study this word. 
If we do, we're going to know what is true, and we're going to know what is false. Deception has become so commonplace in our society that most of us, thank not God, not all the time, but most of us have at one time or another struggled with being able to discern the truth from a lie. Now, I want to give you an example of that. We get a lot of our information from Facebook and Twitter and the news media and from other people, and of course, that's where they get their information too. And everything that we see on Facebook and Twitter and the news media is not true. Now, is that a shock to you? We all know that, don't we? We know that it is not true. So many things look good on the surface, but underneath, they're a horse of a different color. What is on the surface is not always what is really underneath. And I can give you some examples of that. And I don't mind saying I don't ever beat up on other religions from the pulpit. Never will you hear me do that. But I don't have any problem warning you about the cults. I don't have any problem warning you about Mormonism, Scientology, and Jehovah's Witnesses because they don't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ and that makes them a cult. I'm telling you today, they look good on the surface. We have, we've had and have Mormon friends and I'm telling you, they are good, good people. But what they are teaching is demonic. It's demonic because they don't believe that Jesus Christ was God incarnate and that makes them a cult. So what always looks good on the surface is not always is not always what it really really is while I was working on my sermon this past week uh, I got a call from Seattle Washington I thought at first is is that Antifa and uh, but it wasn't but I didn't answer I don't know about you but when I get those calls uh, if I'm pretty sure I don't know anybody in Seattle Washington I don't answer and so they left me a message and the message was this there's somebody in Texas that is trying to use your social security number, so you need to call us and we will take care of it. Now, this wasn't my first rodeo, so I didn't answer them. I didn't answer them because I know they were trying to deceive me. Well, you know, the advertising field has always been a, a little bit... Uh, Exaggerated. Let's put it like that. I don't say they're lying, but they exaggerate the truth a little bit. Uh, when I was in the uh, pharmacy business, um, we had a drug called Lydia Pinkham's. Now, you got to be really old to remember that drug. And uh, anybody remember that? I won't ask you your age, but there was a drug called Lydia Pinkham's. And this is what it said on the, on the bottle. This is for women who are trying to get pregnant. And it was a pink pill. And uh, we used to always say it's a pink pill for pale people. But let me tell you what their slogan was. Their slogan was, there's a baby in every bottle. Now, we know that's not true. If you look at the ingredients in that thing, it wasn't true at all. But they sold a lot of Lydia Pinkham's pills. And so the advertising business has always, always been right on the edge of trying to deceive people. I see this ad on TV. It's called um, Golo. Golo. And uh, I saw another person answering that, and she said, I went low, but I actually went high. I didn't go low. I went high after I tried that diet. So all the advertising is not really what it says it is. It's deceiving if I thought that Prevagen would give me some kind of super brain power, I'd order a thousand bottles this afternoon. But I know that it won't because they're trying to what? They're trying to deceive me. And so deception is everywhere. It's all around us. And so it's important that you and I recognize when something is the truth and when something is deceptive. The other pandemic called deception comes from the devil. Now, the devil is not the source of all deception, but he's one of the sources of deception. The objective of the devil is to deceive you and me and every other believer 
and ultimately destroy us. That's what he's trying to do. The Bible says that in 1 John, or in John 10. It says the devil has come what? To rob and to kill and to destroy. His mission is to destroy you and me, and one of the ways that he can do that is if he can deceive us, then he can, then he can do a number on us. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, the Bible says that they ate the fruit. They ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they fell, they sinned, they recognized right away that they were naked. And then it says that God came to them, and he went to Eve, and he asked Eve, he says, Eve, what happened? And she says, well, she said, the serpent, it was the devil disguised as a serpent, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. And then I gave some to Adam, and Adam also ate. And it led to their destruction because they were deceived by the evil one. Since that moment in the Garden of Eden, the devil has been on a mission to deceive you and me and get us off the path to God. The Bible says that he has been successful in doing that. In Corinthians, it says he has blinded the minds of multitudes of people. He has blinded their minds. He has told them that, hey, there was no virgin birth. Jesus was not God in the flesh. Jesus didn't resurrect from the dead, and Jesus didn't ascend into heaven. And not only that, but Jesus is not the only way to God. There are a lot of ways to God. He's not the only way. And they have deceived many, many people, and they have brought, he has brought them down to destruction because they have believed a lie. Satan has something else in mind for you and me. As believers, he knows that we're not going to turn our back on God. He's not going to deceive us to the degree that we're going to turn our back on God and walk away from God. But he has something else in mind for you, and he has something else in mind for every other born-again believer. Since he wasn't successful in blinding our minds, he wants to drive a wedge between us and God. That's what he's out to do. He wants to, he wants to drive a wedge between us and thereby break our fellowship with God. You see, we've been talking about fellowship with God. And if we're a born-again believer, we are in fellowship with God. There is nothing, nothing better in all of this world to be in fellowship with God. Wow. We have, we, we have that we have that privilege 24-7 to be in the presence of God and to be in fellowship with him, to commune with him and to talk with him and to read his love letter. It is an awesome privilege that you and I have to be in fellowship with God, but the devil wants to drive a wedge between us and God and break that fellowship. If he can break our fellowship with God. If he can get us out of fellowship with God, he'll win the battle. And let me tell you why. When we are out of fellowship, now I'm not talking about losing your salvation. You're still saved. I'm still saved. It's not that at all. It's fellowship. You see, we can still be born again, be saved, and be out of fellowship with God. It's kind of like uh, our spouse. I mean, we're still married, but Maybe we're just not in fellowship today. We can be like that with our kids, with our friends, or anybody. We can still be friends, but we're just out of fellowship with them. There's a little something there that's keeping us from, from being in that close fellowship that we normally have. And so if he can do that, here's, what, here's, here's how he will win the battle. First of all, if we're out of fellowship with him, most of the time we will stop reading his word. God... I just can't do it today, God. i got all these problems. And one of the reasons we don't do it is because we know we'll find an answer there and we don't want an answer yet. I'm talking to the right people. You betcha. Not only that, we will also stop praying. Or 
we will pray prayers. God, I don't want you to drop a brick on them, but would you get their attention? I really do want you to drop a brick on them, God, but would you just get their attention? And God, not only that, you know, God, I'm right. <laughs> I'm right now. I have always been, and I probably always will be. So when we're out of fellowship with God, I mean, we don't pray. We don't read his word. And we don't, we don't come together with him in that close communion that we have always had. Wow. We don't spend that time with him. And what that does is this. If we don't read his word, if we don't pray, and if we don't spend time with him, we are open game to every deceptive trick of the devil. And he's got a bag full of them. He's got a bag full of them. We're aware of some of them. Paul said that. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant about the things. I want you to, I want you to be aware of them. And we're aware of them because he's tried them on us time and again. But I'm not certain that we know about every trick that he has in his bag. You see, when we get out of fellowship with him, we need to do what the prodigal son did. The prodigal son was still the son of his father, still his son. But you know the story. He went to a distant land, spent everything that he had, and he ended up in the pig pen. You see, when we're out of fellowship with God, we will ultimately end up in the pig pen. Mark my words. We will ultimately end up in the pig pen. What did the prodigal son do? The Bible says he came to his senses. He wasn't so full of pride that he wouldn't come to his senses. Sometimes we are so proud that we will stay in the pig pen rather than admit that we were wrong and go back to the Father. When we're out of fellowship with God, we will ultimately end up in the pig pen and we will have to turn. We'll have to turn from our ways and we will have to make a conscious, deliberate decision to go back to our father. And just like the son, when he was coming home to his father, the father was out there, arms open, ready to receive him back to himself. That's how God does with you and me. We make, we make some terrible mistakes. And we get out of fellowship with God. And we get, out of, we get in the pig pen. But when we come to our senses, the Father is always waiting. He's always waiting. And he's always ready to take us back. The other pandemic called deception comes from people. I don't know if you're aware of it, but people will deceive us. People will deceive us. I, mean, I guess all of us have been deceived by other people. I've been deceived by strangers. I've been deceived by uh, friends. I've been deceived by other believers. And I've been deceived by family members. Could you all relate to that? Hey, we've all been deceived. However, not only have we been deceived, if we're really honest about it, we have also deceived other people. I don't want to get a show of hands, but did everybody hear that? I think about it, I think, well, hey, I've deceived people. I've done that. I know I have. People deceive us, and we deceive other people for a number of different reasons. Number one is, uh, there's 100, okay? I'm just going to give you 99. No, just kidding. We deceive people because of jealousy. We are jealous about something, so we deceive them. Selfishness. We deceive people sometimes because we want revenge. I'm going to get even with you, and the best way to do that is if I can deceive you. And so we deceive them by revenge. Sometimes we deceive people for financial gain. Oh, yeah. Social status, trying to cover up something we've done wrong. And the list is endless and endless. And let me give you some real comfort in all of that. 
There's an example of every one of those kinds of deception in the Bible. The Bible is full of men and women who were deceivers. Wow. Doesn't, doesn't make it right, but you remember Joseph's brothers? They deceived their father. They took, a, they took Joseph's robe and dipped it in the animal blood and took it home and said, looks like your son was eaten up by wild animals. That was deception. David deceived the people. When he, had, when he had a child by Bathsheba, what did he do? First of all, he sent her husband down to the, to, the, to the war, to the front line, and had him killed. And he tried to deceive the people that, hey, it's okay what I did. It wasn't okay what he did. There's a story about Isaac and Rebecca. And Isaac and Rebecca had two sons, twins, Jacob and Esau. And right away, they made a big mistake with those boys. The Bible says that, that Isaac loved Esau and Rebekah loved Jacob. Big, big, big mistake. You got to love your kids all the same. And, but you've got to make them think that you love them the best. <laughs> Isn't that true? Amen. We love you all the same, but don't come and say, I think dad loves me the best. Oh, no, I think dad loves me the best. Oh, no, I think he loves me the best. Who do you love the best, dad? All of you. They made a mistake. They separated them out. When the time came for Isaac, for the father, to bless the brother Esau, Rebekah, Rebekah deceived Isaac, and she sent Jacob in to get his blessing. I can't tell you the whole story, but she dressed him up like Esau, put some, he, Esau was hairy, she put some animals' uh, skins on his arm, made it feel like he was, and, and Isaac even said, he was, he was about blind, but he even said, he said, well, your voice sounds like Esau. Oh, no, no, I'm Jacob. So he deceived him too. Jacob deceived him. There's a whole bunch of deception going on there. Uh, and and, and uh, Esau had already sold his birthright to Jacob. So there was a bunch of deception. It was a pretty deceptive family. But the Bible says that, that, that Jacob had to leave home because Esau was going to kill him. And so where did he go? He went to the brother of Rebekah. Her brother was Laban, <laughs> another deceiver. He went down there to Laban. And so uh, Rebe uh, uh, Rebekah says, when you come back, when things cool down, Jacob, you can come home. Let me tell you what it cost Rebecca to be a deceiver. She never, ever, ever saw Jacob alive again. Never saw him the rest of her life. This son that she loved more than anything, she sent him away and she never, ever saw him again. It cost her something to be a deceiver. I'm telling you, when we deceive somebody, it will cost us in the end. And the Bible says that when, when Jacob got down to his uncle Laban's, that uh, Laban had two daughters. Leah and Rachel, and uh, 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 Rachel was a, was a knockout, and uh, Jacob saw that right away, and he fell in love with Rachel, and he wanted Rachel, and he told Laban, he said, hey, he said, I'll work seven years for Rachel, and Laban said, that's fine, and uh, all that while that Jacob worked for Laban, Laban prospered. He'd never prospered like that in all of his life, because God was with Jacob, and he prospered, and then when it came time to get his bride, when it came time to get Rachel, Laban, the master at deception, gave him Leah instead. And he wakes up in the tent the next morning and goes, ah! She wasn't nearly as pretty as Rachel. I'm not quite sure that's what he said, but something like that. Laban, how could you deceive me? Laban could have told him, hey, one good turn deserves another. You've deceived everybody, but he didn't. He said, I'll tell you what, Jacob. He said, if you'll work for me seven more years, I'll give you Rachel. And so he did, and he gave him Rachel. But because of this deception of Laban, Jacob took Rachel and Leah and all of his family, all of their children, took all of their animals and everything, and he fled from Laban. Laban caught up with him. Laban discovered they were gone, and he caught up with them. Laban paid a price. He never, ever 
saw his daughters or his grandchildren again. Deception will cost you and me dearly. It'll cost us dearly. We must be on guard against deceivers, but we must be also be on guard that we do not deceive other people. The Bible says when we deceive someone, we lie, of course, and lying is a sin. And here's what the Bible says about sin. It says, our sins cuts us off from God. Our sin will cut us off from God. And I have said that so many times. I've read that. I have preached that. Our sins will separate us from God. And they will do that. But you know, we don't like the rest of the verse. I'm going to read it to you this morning. This is what it says. Because of our sins, he has turned away from us and he will not hear our prayers. Wow. So when you and I deceive someone, unless we repent of that sin, the Bible says that God, if we're living in that sin, God is not going to listen to our prayers. Well, that's only one time in the Bible. No, it's not. Psalm 66. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened to me. Wow. So we have to be careful that we don't deceive someone else. We certainly want to be on guard that we are not deceived, but we have to be careful that we tell the truth. You know the old saying, if, we, if you tell the truth all the time, you don't have to remember what you said. When you lie, you got to remember how you lie. Because if you don't, you got to lie again. And if you lie again, you got to lie again. And it'll make you out to be a liar. So we have to remember that, hey, I don't want to be deceived, but I'm going to be on my guard, and I'm not going to deceive anyone. I'm going to, I'm going to tell the truth, even, 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 even when it costs me. You see, sometimes telling the truth will cost us dearly. The other pandemic called deception can also come from ourselves. It can come from us. Self-deception is probably the most dangerous of all the deceptions because we are constantly living with the results of self-deception. We continually build our case in our mind when we're self-deceived. And we continually try to convince ourselves that our actions are right and everybody else is wrong. Pride is the root of self-deception because it blinds us to the obvious and it convinces us that no one else is right. I'm going to just give you very briefly three ways that we deceive ourselves. There are many, many, many more. But I think these ways will help you and me to understand how we deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves when we believe that our actions do not have consequences. We deceive ourselves when we believe that our actions do not have consequences. This is what the Bible says in Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will also reap. We all know that, don't we? Man, I'll tell you what, I've heard that so many times. You sow bad seed, you're going to reap a bad crop. It's just flat out that simple. Whatever we sow, that is what we are going to reap. When we make ungodly decisions, we will pay a price for those decisions. You see, we have been given the freedom to decide what kind of a harvest we're going to reap. We've got that freedom. We can decide right away. What kind of harvest am I going to reap? But it's predicated on what kind of seed I sow. If I sow good seed, I'm going to reap a good harvest, and so are you. If I sow bad seed, I'm going to reap a bad harvest, and so are you. So if we sow seed to our sinful nature, the Bible says this, 
then if, if we sow seed to our sinful nature, what are we going to do? We're going to spend our time, and we're going to spend our money, and we're going to spend our talent, and everything else, we're going to spend that on the things of this world, and in the end, it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble. It's not going to amount to one iota of anything. But if in fact, if we sow, if we sow our time, and we sow our money, and we sow our talent into godly things, the Bible says that one of these days, we're going to reap a harvest. We're going to reap a harvest. Now, sometimes, sometimes that harvest comes in this world. You see, there's a principle of God. All the principles of God work. You know that, don't you? Every principle of God in this book, it works. And we don't necessarily follow all of his principles just to get from God. But the fact is, if we live by the principles of God's Word, we're going to benefit from the result of those principles. Let me just give you one. And, and you know, if you're a visitor today, I never talk about... I don't want to say never. I do. Maybe once or twice a year, I talk about money. I talk about money. I don't have to talk about money because the people, most of you people know the principles of God's Word. I don't have to talk about... There's one principle. It's in Malachi. It says what? It said, if you'll bring the tithe into the storehouse, he said, I'll open up the windows of heaven and I'll pour out a blessing on you that you will not be able to contain. And not only that, I will rebuke the devourer on your behalf. Well, that's just Old Testament. Let me give you a New Testament. Given, it'll be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure that you give, so also will it be measured unto you. It's a principle of God. You see, I, I see people sometimes, they say, man, I tell you, I'm just leaving, I'm just living from paycheck to paycheck. I said, I can give you a way to get out of that. I can give you a way to be rich. Really? Well, who do I need to call? Jesus. Jesus. That's right. He can do it every time. It's a principle of God. And if we'll live by God's principles, we'll prosper by God's principles. We deceive ourselves into believing that our actions do not have consequences. Here's another one. We deceive ourselves if we think that sin is no big deal. I read something here. I may have told you this story. It just came to my mind, but I'll tell you again. You've probably forgotten it by now, anyhow. Not you people. I know you. <laughs> Calvin Coolidge went to church one time, and, and uh, he was one of our presidents, you know. And he came home, and his wife asked him. He said, well, she said, how was church? He was a man of few words, and he said, okay. Well, what did the pastor preach on? Sin. Well, what did he say about it? He was against it. <laughs> you see, sometimes we deceive ourselves if we think that sin is not a big deal with God. Let me just read you a scripture. And let me tell you, when I read this scripture, you'll know that it pretty well covers everything. He said, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Wow. And then he says this, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Jesus said on that day, many, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we did this in your name. We did this in your name. We cast out demons. We did all of these things in your name. And then the Lord is going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. The bottom line is they never knew him. They never knew him. And he says, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Now, I didn't make this up, okay? I'm reading it from the Bible. Everybody okay with that? Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters. And let me tell you what idolatry is. Idolatry is anything that comes between us and God. Probably covers all of us right there, doesn't it? I have to start over. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. 
pretty well got all of us, didn't it? What is he talking about? He's talking about living that kind of a lifestyle. None of us are perfect. The Bible says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What he is saying is simply this. If you choose to live that kind of a lifestyle, you got a problem. The question is this. And I have to ask myself this. Can I profess to be a follower of Jesus Christ? and live like the world? It's a good question. You see, sometimes we think, how much can I get by with? How close to the edge can I come without, without having a tremendous problem? Well, let's talk about something more pleasant. We deceive ourselves when we don't obey the Word of God. That's simple. James says, do not merely listen to the word, but do what the word says. Do what it says. You see, we can read the word, we can listen to the word, and we can do all those things. And if we never change, we are deceived. If the word of God does not change us, if this word does not change me, the Bible says we are being changed from glory to glory. But if it doesn't change me today, if there isn't something in the word today that doesn't change me in some way, I am deceived. He says that. Don't be deceived. Hey, do not listen to the word, but do what the word says. Let me read it a little farther. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror. Now get the picture. It's like somebody looking in a mirror, and after looking at himself, he goes away and forgets what he looks like. So when I look in the mirror in the morning, sometimes I think, who is that? No. When I look in the mirror in the morning, I know that I need a shave. I, I, I know that when I look in the mirror. So I look in that mirror, and I know that I need a shave. But looking in the mirror doesn't change my appearance. I have to do something about it. And that's what he's saying. Hey, when you look in the mirror and you see what needs to be done, the fact is you've got to do something about it. You've got to do something about it. You just can't, you can't brush it off and not do anything. The other pandemic called deception can be defeated. This is where we're going this morning. We don't have to be deceived. Our text says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether or not they are from God. Everything that we hear, everything that we experience, we have to test it. And we have to see if it's from God or if it's from the forces of darkness. There are two, there are two forces at work in the, in the earth, the forces of good and the forces of evil. Obviously, God is good. The devil is evil. Those two forces are working on you and me every day. They work on us from the time we get up in the morning until we go to bed at night. And every time that we encounter something that, that, that we think, well, I don't know. I don't know if this is God or I don't know if this is the devil, then I have to test that spirit. It says that, that we have to test that spirit, and we have to test it and see, is that God, or is that the enemy speaking to me and trying to deceive me? We can do that. We can test it. One of the ways we test it is this. The Bible says that you and I, every believer, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in us. And so what do we do? We ask the Holy Spirit. We, you can talk to him. It's okay. People, they think, well, you're talking to yourself. No, I'm talking to the Holy Spirit in me. I say, Holy Spirit, is this of God or is this of darkness? Is this of light or is this of darkness? Is this of God or is this of the devil? And the Holy Spirit will answer us. I have to give you a, 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 a it just occurred to me that Gloria and I, um, we don't trade very, cars very often. We had a 12-year-old car. Ran good. Ran good. But, you know, 12-year-old car, uh, uh, we needed to trade the cars. So we, we went to St. Louis, a place that, uh, that, we, uh, that we found a car that we liked. And so uh, we went over to get the car. Liked the car. Wonderful. 
On the way over there, we prayed. We prayed, Lord, if this car is not for us, we want you to make it so crystal clear that it's not for you. And when we got there, we liked the car. The car ran great, and the price was good. And we said, we'll take it. But when we went out to drive it, the guy that was the salesman, he said, there's a little bitty dent right here on this side, and there's a little bitty one in the same place on the other side. He said, we can get that fixed. I'm, okay, good with me. When we came in, you can hardly see it. If he hadn't seen it, I'd never seen it. But we prayed. And when we came in, we sat down at the desk, and the guy comes from the shop. He said, I'm going to get it checked over, get it ready to go. Guy comes from the shop, said, we can't sell you that car. I said, how did he know we didn't have the money? <laughs> he said, we can't sell you that car. I said, well, why not? He said, because that car is a mess. He said, we put it up on the rack, and those two little dents. He said, that car had been dropped off of a transport carrier, and he said, everything underneath the front of it, he said, I don't know how it runs. It's all broken to pieces. All broken to pieces. You know, Gloria and I went, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for not letting us be deceived. And I said, we still like the car. Said, we can't sell it to you, but I'll get you one just like it. And he didn't do that. He got us the same kind of car with, with 5,000 less miles on it and one that had everything together underneath. When we went to get that, we prayed, Holy Spirit, <laughs> you know what happened last time? And we liked that car so much. That's what the Holy Spirit will do. He will keep us from being deceived. Let me tell you another, another way we can, we can keep from being deceived. The Bible says in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it lists the nine gifts of the Spirit. One of the gifts of the Spirit is the discerning of spirits. Now, that doesn't mean reading somebody else's mind. It means that that, that gift will come up on us. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit gives that to whomever he pleases, whenever he pleases, but it's okay to ask. It's okay. If we, if we need any kind of the gifts of the Spirit working in our lives today, it's the gift of discerning of spirits. We need to know, is that from God or is that from the devil? Is that from light or is it from darkness? And it says, if you'll ask, he'll give you. He'll give you. So we ask him, Holy Spirit, give me the gift of being able to discern if this particular thing is from you or if it's from the devil. And he will do that. The greatest weapon that we have against being deceived is right here. If it doesn't measure up with the Word of God, turn away from it. Turn away. This is, this is the standard. And anything in this life that doesn't measure up to this standard could possibly be deceiving. That's all saying. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, God, that you have given us everything that we need for life and godliness. We thank you for your word that we can compare everything that comes our way to your word and we can determine by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us if it's from you or if it's from the sources of evil. So God, we thank you today that you, your Holy Spirit dwells in us and we have that power in us not to be deceived and certainly not to be a deceiver. And we thank you today, God, that you changed us this morning. You said that you're changing us from glory to glory and that you have changed us this morning and we'll never be the same because of your word, because of the power that is in your word. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. Have a great week. Yeah, you hold my